All right, everybody, welcome back to the Pat Flynn Show. We are back for part two of our uh, conversation here with Dan John and special guest Dr. Jim. And I think that we wanted to explore some easy strength on this on this episode. But first, um, how's everyone doing? Uh, how was how was uh, Dan? Let's start with you. What's been what's been going on? What's new this uh, this past week? Have a good Christmas and all that. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> it's uh, a, a muted Christmas. Uh, you know, we did our best. Uh, we we tend we tend to have a big celebration, as you know, called Christmas Adam, where it's uh, you know because Adam came before Eve, so it's the night. Jim, it's the night before Christmas Eve. So sure, sure. Christmas Adam. We I like that. It's cool. Okay. As and long as everybody keeps all their ribs. <laughs> the the thing is that uh, most people don't have anything to do on that night, so we found it a nice place to insert a family friends gathering. It doesn't overlap with the school nativity play or any church yeah. services, and so really good idea, yeah. So we couldn't do it this year, and it was and it's sad. Um, it was, uh, I've got a number of elderly friends who I just can't, you know. All I can really do is call them up and say, you know, uh, Merry Christmas, and that's that's tough. You know, my friend Sarah and I, she's my 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 eighty nine year old buddy. We're we're makers mark friends you know we, we always uh, tip a few makers together and can't couldn't see her this year that's how we became friends dan i think it was makers yeah but the the one thing that was good this year is i had a chance uh, my wife and i uh i was able to call all my living siblings and that's good and uh um i'm i'm let's just say um i have concerns about uh, some of their health so yeah but uh, my wife called all her family too and that was kind of nice it was a, we were able to because it was so much quieter we had that time to make the phone calls to a lot of friends and family so i'm not being da danny downer i'm just saying it was no, no no you know just a little muted a different year yeah how about yeah. you jim good I, I had a great christmas i think i mentioned you guys off the air that uh my oldest son whom i did not expect to see for christmas surprised me and showed up on my doorstep right um, on his first leave in the marine corps that was just fabulous and uh, you know we didn't go see uh, a lot of times we would either my wife's family would come to us or we would go uh, a lot of times we'd go to see my family in wisconsin but uh, for covid reasons that didn't work out um but otherwise it was the regular christmas around the house you know all the kids were there and uh you know we uh, we had a, on Christmas Eve after the vigil, we had kind of a cookie party for the neighborhood kids at our house. It was pretty cool, right? And we had a great, we had a great Christmas. Uh, on Christmas Day, I went out with a run for a run with my son, who's a cross country runner, and took a vicious beatdown. <laughs> 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 he was nice, and you know he was great. And, and and but man, at the end when he when he turned it on, I I had I found out how deeply he was toying with me. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait till the till that comes up. So. Quiet, uh, quiet Christmas over here at the Flynn household. Very nice, very beautiful. But Dan, Jim, I don't know if you're a if you're a Star Wars guy, but I did I did finish the Mandalorian. Oh yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent. I won't give any spoilers if people haven't haven't seen it. But Dan was pushing me to watch it. <coughs> Actually, Dan and Gavin, who we were talking to later, were both like, "You have to watch it." I'm like, "All you guys said all these good things about the new Star Wars movies, and I hated them." But like, no, this is this is different. You're gonna like I it. Didn't, so. I didn't. I never one time said the new Star Wars movies. <laughs> you, you, yeah, you're the exception there. But everyone else was like, the new Star Wars movies, they're they're awesome. They're going to be classics. I'm like, all right, I go and see them. And yeah, yeah no, 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 they were terrible, right? Yeah. Um, but the series was was phenomenal. Easily one of my favorite series of, of all time. An, an, an amazing, amazing uh, finish there, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's significant for me, Pat, because, uh, you know, I, I'm such a deep Gen Xer, right? You know, so, you know, I saw Star Wars in the, in a drive-in theater in 1977. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was, you know, I remember, so like the first movie I, my, my folks took me to basically, right? So I was a Star Wars kid, you know, and then um, I think I was in grad school when the first new run of the movies came out. And I just, I just walked out thinking, I just watched a video game for two hours. So I haven't seen any of them. Okay. So I know I'm going to get like hate mail now, um, but on your recommendation, I, I'll, I'll give the Mandalorian a try. Well, oh. Dan, I, the thing for me is it's all about good stories are about character development, characters, yeah. and uh, you also need a good villain, right? Like it's hard to have a good story without a good villain. And I think all those things were missing from the new Star Wars movie. Like, yeah, cool CGI, cool. Yeah. 
blasters, but you just you just never got that deep emotional investment in the character in the yeah, character. I, I always explain it this way. Spielberg, when he made the Indiana Jones series, the first three, he made a vow that he would only use special effects that were around in 1934, I think it was. Ah, interesting. And when they did the fourth one, which is unwatchable, they yeah. used CGI. The monkeys is the worst scene <laughs> in the history of theater. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what happens is that nowadays we have the ability to, oh, we don't need a story. We'll make... We'll, well, you know, I, I know a lot of you our gentle listeners love the Marvel uh, movies. And I honestly, if you'd let me repackage them, they would be 22 minutes each and they'd be a great story about the character. Yes. yes, yes. We would cut out that three hour fight sequence. Yes. Uh, the new Bond movies are unwatchable. Well, not so, Daniel Craig's are, are fun. <clears throat> but these these car sequences that go on for 35 minutes. Yeah. And, you know, um, I just, I just, uh, I think the, the great tradition of storytelling, uh, you know, I've had good teachers who could weave a story and you would sit there and you, you felt uh, when uh, Dr. Friend would talk about the battle of Agincourt or something, and you just felt by the end of the class, you know, it's like, you felt like you were walking over the bodies, you know, uh, yeah. no special effects, just the voice. So that, that's me. Yeah. That's, you that's know, one, one last thing on that, I think I think you're spot on, Dan. Is um, apparently the Mandalorian was written by John Favreau, who did the first Iron Man movie. And um, what struck me about it, and what I and maybe this is just me being a sentimentalist now that I'm a dad, but it really seems to be a series about fatherhood. Okay, hmm. right? Um, with, the, with, with, with the baby Yoda, right? Um, and uh, I don't know. I just found that very touching. And there was a lot of similarities I saw in the in the first Iron Man movie, which is probably my favorite of all the Marvel movies, because there's actually not a ton of it's not like the later ones that are just filled with the CGI action scenes. It, it's more about the, the character yeah. arc of, of Tony Stark. Right. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, good stuff. Um, yeah, well, hold on. Can I say something? Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't have one on me, but I want to have Rowan give you a gold star. Because I think what you just said about the Mandalorian actually stopped me in my tracks. And oh. I'm going to probably watch them all again because of what you just said there. Mm -hmm. There's a very famous Siskel and Ebert where Siskel, I can't remember which was which, but one of them hated Apocalypse Now. And the other one looked at it and said, well, as they go deeper and deeper into the jungle, the less and less civilized they become. And it was Siskel, he went, I need to watch the entire film again. Uh, I think what you just did is you, you just had a Cisco and Ebert moment for me, Patrick. So thank you. Well, good. Well, good. I need to um, watch the entire series again. Yeah. So, not, this is not the show I was looking for. <laughs> so Jim, if you, if you get caught up, you have to let us know your thoughts, but yeah, uh, I will. I will. let's, uh, all right, let's turn to business now. Um, so we were, we kind of ended the last episode with, um, Jim giving us a little tease yeah. on um, – well, Dan and I have talked about easy strength in many different contexts, but one thing that we've talked about recently is this idea of easy strength for fat loss. We did an episode on that, I don't know, maybe two, three weeks ago or something. And uh, Jim, you're like, that's, that's what I do. <laughs> that's, just, that's, just, that's just what I've been doing. So I'd love to, uh, I'd love to focus in on this because this is a, a theme that a lot of people um, have, uh, have been interested in. So I'd love to explore both your experiences with it, and then we'll, we'll jam around with Dan and maybe get into some – wherever the conversation takes us. So please, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Dan, when I watched your, I think you, you had a, uh, it was on your podcast, right? A tutorial on easy strength for fat loss. Yeah. It was just, uh, I think I might've been a, just a, here you go workshop. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Jim, I decided in 2020 that I would, I put out probably 20 free workshops on my site. Some one's an hour and a half. There's a couple in the hour range sure just both. because I just felt that, if, if, if it helps one, if it helps one person kind of, yeah. you know, that's, yeah, I'm, I'm no Mandalorian. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, when, okay. So what read, I mean, I was familiar with easy strength. Uh, you know, I, I had read the book when it first came out and loved it. And those, uh, though my favorite part of easy strength, the book is you guys included those old school like er moment west side barbell deadlift programs that were based on singles 
And those, those programs are what I responded to best on the deadlift in my whole 30 years of, of lifting, right? That's what I got. That's what got me to 300% body weight deadlift was, was those programs. Yeah. Anyway. And so I was you know, familiar with the concepts and it really, you know, it's, once again, it's the Taco Bell thing. Like easy strength is very similar to a lot of the, the Pavel stuff, right. And, and a lot of the Taco Bell stuff, all this. And, but I have a certain way I train in the summers. Okay. Cause I, you know, I don't teach in the summer. So I have a little more time in the mornings. Right. And typically what I do is, you know, I'll wake up, I'm pretty wrecked from training jujitsu the night before. Okay. So there's, there's not a lot of high energy here. And um, I don't want to deplete any adrenaline on a workout that I don't have to at that point. Right. Okay. Cause I want to roll again hard that night. And what I just, you know, you know how it works when you start playing with stuff, you sort of naturally evolve towards certain patterns that work and you, and you kind of hang out there a while. And I have found what really worked for me is I would get up, uh, I would go out to the garage or the, or the yard, wherever I'm working out that day with a cup of coffee, like listening to NPR, like chill is possible. Right. And I would do, you know, five sets of weighted pull-ups. I do five sets of some kind of press or the windmill. I'm a big fan of the windmill, though I don't recommend it for everybody, right? Uh, I would do five sets of some kind of squat variation, usually goblets, sometimes an offset, one side of kettlebell thing. Uh, and typically the rep ranges would be, if I'm not feeling great, they'd be singles, right? If I'm feeling great, they could be fives, right? So averages out 10-ish, right? And I would do that and I would go for a walk um, mainly because I wanted the sun exposure. Uh, so I take my shirt off uh, and go for a walk. The walk would be 30 minutes or, you know, however long, you know, the, uh, the Pat Flynn show was that day on my podcast. Right. <laughs> and, and that was it. And I find when I get on that groove, right. Uh, I recover better and I get leaner. Uh, I get the leanest I, I ever get when I'm doing that. Right. And I'm intentionally not trying to get my heart rate up. Right. I'm intentionally uh, trying not to uh, get adrenaline going. Right. And it's, and, and it's a very similar format to what you talk about easy strength with fat loss, right? Some, some chill, heavy ish strength work, right. Uh, followed by a chill walk. It might be a jog some days if I just feel like I like the physical act of jogging. Right. And, um, and I also, I do that in a fast. So typically the last meal I eat in a day is about four 30 uh, in the afternoon and then I'll train jujitsu at night and then I'll get up the next morning and I won't eat until after that workout, even a couple hours. Like I haven't eaten since four o'clock last night right now. Um, and so I'll do that in a, in a fast. I drink a ton of coffee, right? Uh, you know, I, I eat a lot of vegetable matter and, and pretty low carbohydrate. And, and so when I saw that video, I was like, that is what I've been doing, right? For a couple of years is my main, and, I, and I'll go into, I'll do challenge stuff here and there, just for the hell of it right it's good for you i think to do that but that's my base that's what i fall back into and i'm at 47 years old the leanest i've ever been uh all the all the attributes are right where i'd want them to be and it it just it's worked perfectly for me yeah you know uh, I, I like i i think everything you said there just i think we all come to the same place ultimately when it comes to adult fat loss yes uh, it, 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 it you, you'll hear it in different ways. I've got Matthew Tone's uh, new book right behind me and I've got, I got this and I got that. And we're hearing you say this. We all seem to come to the same place that, <clears throat> uh, yeah, well. Hold on, Dan, Dan, adult fat loss. I got a name of the episode. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I think what happens is, and I, and I do believe this, and I think leaning out, if, if, if it's like you said, I love your point about challenge. That's what I want to come to first. Mm -hmm. So I'm about to start the 10,000 swing challenge in about two or three days again with this group, this January group. And I don't know why I'm doing it. I don't, I have done it. I don't, I'm not going to get, yeah, I'll get something from it. It'll be the best thing I ever did in my life. Good for me. But sometimes you need challenges, mm -hmm. you know? And for me, <clears throat> January is always a good time for a challenge. I think May is a good time. The way my schedule works out, May, June are good challenge months. Mm -hmm. The rest of the time you have to be, you have to work with the way the body flows. And what's nice about, no matter how you attack it, but what we're trying to do with the easy strength workout, and it's interesting because one of the most more famous fat loss experts, Rusty Moore, basically uses the same technique for his fat loss clients. And he calls his clients 
yacht body. You know, those pictures of people in the, the, the perfume magazine, you know, the, yeah, yeah. the guy's yeah. sitting like this and he's got, you know, you know, he's, he's 1% body fat, but he's got, you know, 13 inch bicep. You um, have a whole portfolio of yacht body pictures, don't you, Dan? And yeah, I do. Uh, I sent them to you. I hope you like yeah, them. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll put them on the I show now. Yeah. I tell you, that, uh, that thong, it's hard to get into some days. Uh, but <clears throat> so what the, the, the idea, there's two sides of the easy story. First, what most people need is a level of tension. Okay, so tension, it, and it's weird to say this, but so we're going to build tension in that easy strength stuff. Yeah. Okay, we're also going to raise the heart rate not a lot, but just enough to get you into those tone fat loss numbers, which yeah. is 180 minus age and 160, and between 180 minus age and 160 minus age, which is a relatively low number. And I like what you said about, you know, NPR, Pat Flynn, you keep it chill, you, but it's a 45 minute walk. Yeah. And if you do it in a fasted state, <laughs> fasted state, a lot of coffee, you you push your strength a little bit. You, you are going to get a hormonal cascade from that. Then you go for this walk that's reasonable. And I think if you get your heart rate up to uh, the, the, the in made up number from the 1960s and 70s, 220 minus age, that's when you start to freak the body out. When you freak the body yeah. out, I feel that it kind of clings to things like something bad has happened. We're going to need all the fat we can to survive this. So yeah, by gently yeah. nudging body fat, hey, we need. Why don't we get rid of this? It'll be easier to walk without this. Okay, that sounds good. I think that works a lot better. And it, it's interesting because I keep hearing uh, the same kind of thing. People keep coming back to the same basic thing yeah. you just said. Yeah. You know? So um, yeah. let's talk. Let's talk about the fasting side a little bit because I think we're all advocates. We all we all practice it. But I'd like to hear what everyone's doing. So so Jim, you said you're. Your last meal, not your first meal, but your last meal, is that four thirty? Was that four thirty? Yeah. So what is what is your eating window? Uh, usually about noonish to four thirty. Okay, so you've uh, got about like a four hour oh, eating window yeah. in there. Wow, that real tight. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that's it, that's it, classic it, warrior diet stuff. Remember yeah, that? Remember yeah. that one? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Sure. And it's it's, it's just and, and once again I, on especially on diet I like it, you know. You have to you have to ask who you who you're dealing with, right? I mean, are you dealing with someone who's already in the game, disciplined, et cetera, et cetera? Like you can't take someone who's, you know, like not far down the road of being a recovering fat person and say, hey, you just gotta kind of figure it out and find your body rhythms, because their body rhythms are gonna be like slurpees, right? Or you know what I mean? But like once, like once uh, and I'm not I'm not trying to mock anyone, but but once you're like really in the game, like I like to just you just start a thing, a kind of a basic principle and just see where it works out for you. And once I got into the fasting thing, I found I just wasn't getting hungry till 11 o'clock in the morning or noon, right? Uh, and, and so that's just how it fell in for me. Yeah, so I typically, you know, I'll eat something on the way out of the door, usually like a can of sardines on my way to train jujitsu at night at like 4.30. And then I really won't be rip roaring hungry until noon the next day. Bones or no bones? Bones and the whole thing. I want the whole Monty. Yeah. That's yeah, something about the sardine thing. I find I just don't get hungry after it. Maybe it's just so revolting, right? But I, I don't get hungry and I, I seem to get a pretty good bounce energy wise off that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, if you can, it, it, the gentle listener will find this horrible to hear, but if you can do kimchi or sauerkraut with sardines, yeah. I call that a gut biome break. Yeah. And what's funny is that someone will say, well, don't you get hungry? And I say, well, did you try the kimchi sardine thing? Yeah. No, I, that sounds terrible. Yeah. Well, and that's, yeah. yeah. It, it can't always be chocolate eclairs, the chocolate eclair diet. It, there has to. Yeah. But, when, but your, the, the sardines are really good for, your, obviously, your, your, your cardiovascular system. Your, it's great protein. It's probably pretty good for your, your gut bacteria because of the, the nature of the sardine. Yeah, right. Yeah. Add a little olive oil, maybe a little hot sauce. And you got a pretty tasty snack there yeah. too. So Dan, for you then, what is, um, cause I know you've done, you do the fast mimicking throughout the year, but what are you, what are you doing right now? Well, okay. I've stopped fast mimicking. But there's only one reason folks, uh, during the COVID thing, uh, I just feel fast mimicking. If you don't know is, uh, basically it's five days, about 500 calories a day, mostly ve oh, entirely vegetables, 
with some nuts and some uh, olives. And I do that because my, my family dies, if not from America's wars, we die of cancer. So it, it, on paper, it's supposed to help with, you know, building your body up against cancer. During the COVID, I've backed off on that, uh, Patrick, because it is a stressful five days. And honestly, with the way some of the things that have happened, for example, the, the COVID relief bill almost not being signed, it was signed, obviously with them last 24 hours. But there's just, there's the stressors in my life right now. Uh, they, I don't need to add, hey, here's, here's yeah. 500 calories a day. Here. Yeah, yeah, don't, <laughs> yeah don't, don't need to add stress to stress. So, get it, but yeah. for me, the, 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 almost my normal thing now is, um, and it's all about the window. Mm -hmm. uh, I like what Art Devaney said one time. He said, you know, he either eats breakfast or he doesn't. He, 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 at most, he eats two meals a day. But if there's two ways to do it, it's either you compress it like you do to that mm -hmm. four, four and a half hour window, that which is, you know, a, a hardcore way to go. Or Devaney's idea that you eat breakfast uh, and then you have this other, eight, you know, this eight hour window to the next meal. Mm -hmm. Then you have your dinner then you have this big window. But I think, I think anytime you're not shoveling food down your throat, you're technically fasting. Yeah. So I am, you know, I'm fasting right now. Oh, I'm not anymore. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Cause I, I drank the coffee, but one of the things that's hurt, I think a lot of us is that we become grazers. And uh, uh, I, I first picked this up reading Ellington garden, which is amazing to say probably back in 82 when he was commenting on what the French called Americans. They called us the balloon people. And this, this person from France noted that Americans tend to waddle from fast food place to fast food place, constantly grazing. So one of the things you have to do if you go into this fasting lifestyle is you're gonna get, you're gonna have to A, embrace hunger, which once you do is really just an urge. You know, it takes us right back to Genesis chapter three. It, there, yes. it, it's urge is towards you, but you can be its master. I miss being hungry when I'm not fasting. Did, you know, like I, I, I feel really good being a little hungry, right? right. And I feel right. sharp, and and you know, and there's evolutionary reasons for that, right? I'm in like hunt kill mode now, right? And well, in, you know, in falconry, it's called Yarek, Y A R A K. It's mm -hmm. the vision. An, a, a hungry raptor has yeah and so much clear uh pavel and i've had these conversations all the time about you never eat until you finish your writing assignments for the day yeah because your ability you, you start to hunt words yeah you know yeah. you'd be like you know honey you want no you know yeah that's actually a lot how my day plays out you know except when i have to you know interrupt it with my job teaching but uh so so like the, you know the most like okay you think of it. my last meal at 4 30 in the in the afternoon i'll train jujitsu in there sometimes twice sometimes i'll do a morning thing too okay but you know, i'll train jujitsu i'll have my easy strengthish workout uh and i'll do a lot of my reading and writing all in that fast by noon okay and then and then i feel you know like i i take I get less done in the afternoon after I've eaten, right? So a lot of like the really good stuff cognitively, physically for me is done in that fast. Yeah. So I, I wonder if you're like me then, Jim, because as a human being, I'm essentially worthless between the hours of 1 and 4 p.m. Yeah. Yeah. So I might I'm as well I'm a morning eat. guy. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah no, like I, 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 it's different for people that I talk to, but you know, I sort of have my cognitive sweet spot where I get my best work done generally between like one, I wake up and 11 AM. Yep. And then I, I occasionally get the second wind, you know, around like four, but you know, there's, there's that, there's that period where, yeah, I, I can't form sentences. I'm just, it just, I just don't have it. So, yeah. um, yeah, I, I like that idea then because my, my eating window is larger than yours. Mm -hmm. Um, I have somewhat of an of an opposite uh, disposition, though, in the sense that, as we, we talked about before, I'm a, I'm a dispositional skinny bastard, right? Yeah, so it's yeah. very hard for me um, to actually get enough. Like my my struggle is getting enough calories most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, so fasting is something that I enjoy, that I feel really productive on. Um, so I, I do it uh, largely for those reasons because I don't 
for me, I don't need to fast to stay, to stay lean generally. Um, uh, so I do it. Yeah. Why do I do it? I do it because I feel good. Um, I do it because it's an, it's sort of a good aesthetic discipline. Um, I like, you know, I like the chat, the challenge, if you will, of just sitting uh, comfortably with your hunger. I mean, Ori Hoffmeckler, he's big on that, right? He talks about just being in the hunter's mode when you're fasting. I think that's a true thing. Um, you could show me that this would, you could prove to me this will shorten my life. I think I would still do it. <laughs> yeah, but, 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 but it should, but it shouldn't, right? So there was a study that came out in cell metabolism not too long ago. I talked about this on the podcast where um, one of the kind of working uh, hypotheses with, with fasting of why it seems to promote health is just because it controls calories, right? Which is a general hypothesis with a lot of diets. Like they work because it controls yeah. calories. But the study in cell metabolism found that even, when you control for calories, fasting still has independent health benefits, which was, which was cool, which well, is cool to see. The concept on fast mimicking is that it's the autophagy or autophagy that your body goes through uh, when it starts to consume itself, but it, it goes after the old cells. You know, I, we need those amino acids here, pal, and pulls them in and reboots. Uh, real, do you mind if I just go real quick through what we're talking about in case someone's clueless about what we're saying? Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay, very simply, uh, gentle listener. Um, basically, after your dinner, uh, <laughs> try not to consume calories unless it's uh, really good uh, whiskey. So after dinner, you you fast, you you sleep through the night, you wake up. It depending on how your schedule works, but. Uh, it does seem that caffeine helps now because caffeine pops that free fa fasting and caffeine seem to produce the free fatty acids into your system. Well, now these free fatty acids are floating around with the caffeine. Now we're going to go in and take care of those free fatty acids. So what you do first is you do, uh, I would recommend about a total of 10 reps, three sets of three, five sets of two, five, three, two, whatever, six singles in a vertical push overhead press generally a vertical pull works best that can be a lap pull down pull up chin up whatever a hinge generally a deadlift works well and then the ab wheel okay those four exercises uh, depending on what you need we'll throw in a fifth that could be something as simple as farmer carries suitcase carry uh kettlebell swing depending on what you want to do when i'm trying to do the fat loss i recommend five sets of 15 in the swing but all we're trying to do is ramp that heart rate up and then whoosh, out the door. So the fast, the caffeine, the short strength workout, those few swings, all free up the free fatty acid, the walk. Uh, ideally, you will consume them if you keep your heart rate at a very, at least the talk test. You should be able to talk to someone very, very efficiently and easily. If you are... Yeah. that's too too fast you, you know it's interesting too because it's, it's 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 superficially counterintuitive but it, there's actually deep sense when you when you think about it because when people typically want to lose weight they think i want to i want to challenge myself in all directions at once right so i want to do the fasting i want to drop the carbs drop the calories and i want to do the most intense crossfitty type of stuff that i can right and what you find is there's very quickly uh, especially for adults there's a clash there because to the extent that you're, you're training like a madman, um, the more difficult the dieting restrictions become. Right. Um, and, but the, but the dieting is, is the more critical aspect here to the fat loss. So it actually makes more sense. And I would, I would argue, I think we all agree from experience on this, uh, to focus on the, on the dietary restrictions, if you will, that we're talking about and then have the more reasonable training approach with the easy strength, there's, there's, there's a, there's a greater compatibility and sustainability there that I think you'll get more of the results that you're looking for in terms of fat loss. I think that's sort of the overall theme maybe that we're now, Jim, I'd be curious with you because you still have the intense jujitsu training. So, yeah. um, how do you think that that plays into this? Well, I mean that, that okay. So that, that's one of the reasons why, uh, I kind of, you know, gravitated toward that easy strength kind of training, right. It's cause that, I mean, I, I wasn't looking, you know, I was already very happy with my body composition and my weight when I, you know, when I started developing this way of training. Um, but uh, it just, it, this left me intact for the mat at night, right? I could do this, I could do this 
box check kind of strength workout in the morning uh, and then be good to go to train very hard later, right? And this, this is another point I want to bring too is one of the things I found is the best recovery aid for me is a chill strength workout. Okay, so for instance, last night, I got after it on the mat, got after it, okay, with all these giant young people, right, okay? <laughs> and um, I woke up this morning and I was a wreck, okay? But I went out to the garage, I did some get-ups, right? Uh, I did some uh, heavy-ish cleans, right? Did some jonda sit-ups, uh, did some mace swings in that, that all in that kind of range that Dan's talking about here. And, you know, uh, went for a little stroll around the neighborhood and I feel like a million bucks now. And I could, I could roll indefinite rounds this afternoon. I would be fine. I, I find, I don't, I don't know the science on this, but I find easy strength-ish stuff and other people I've recommended this to have found the same thing is just a great tool for recovering from that really hard athletic work. Mm. Can I add a bit of science? It's, it's not yeah. the best, but there's that terrible TV show called Biggest Loser. Yeah. And one researcher went back and studied the, the contestants. And mm -hmm. what they found was two things. First, most of the people who participated in this, this show lost a lot of weight on the show. Most of them, I believe, I think it was 31 of 32 regained all their weight which I saw, it was a number like that. It was huge. But more importantly is that they studied their leptin levels and about a decade after the show, their leptin levels were still wrong. They were still, they had broken, uh, they had broken hormonal systems. Hmm. And leptin is the one that tells you you've had enough. Hmm. So what, what, when Rob, what you said about this thing about people got all fired up into CrossFit and they're going to, I'm going to do CrossFit and do zero, you know, zero carbs and, and I'm not going to eat fat and I'm not going to eat protein. So that's my diet. Uh, a joke. Yeah. 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 And you do. And all of a sudden, you know, six, 10, 14 weeks later, everyone's going, my God, Bernadette, what are you doing? Oh my God, I'm doing CrossFit. That's fine. And that's true. Yeah. You look better. My concern is four years down the road yeah. because you know, <laughs> Uh, to, to quote uh, uh, Mr. Rocky Balboa, you got to pay the piper. Yes, you do. And the piper is what are you doing in the deep, deep recesses of your brain and hormonal systems? Yes, yes. Because uh, yeah, they are thinking, well, literally, shit is coming down. And when things get normal, we're going to, in, we're yeah. going to pack on as much fat as we possibly can. Uh, and, that, Dan, that's pure gold. I want, every everybody out there to write that down right that that's pure gold and then that and then one of the things with the biggest loser is i don't want i said this last time i don't like any kind of program that has a deadline like i'm going to get 100 pounds off by this date or something like that because is that because one it, it 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 lends itself to that kind of bad extreme thinking and two and you think you're off the hook at some point if i just get through the 12 week death program and lose the 50 pounds then i'm done you know, uh, uh, it's never over, right? It's never over. It, 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 especially if you, and I've seen this as someone who was like very, I weighed 300 pounds, right? Yeah. You're a recovering addict for the rest of your life. Okay. You are. Okay. It gets better, but it's not over. Right. And it has to be sustainable and it has to re actually repair you to physical and psychological health. Right. It has to do that. Right. So I'd be curious to, um, to pick both of your brains on the on the idea of cycling and challenges because I'm I'm with you right like it, it's good. It's, for one second yeah, yeah. please just you know uh, Jim, the most attacked I've ever been on one of my articles was for men's health they asked mm -hmm. me to write about New Year's resolutions and I said I don't care what you say your right. goal so for us in 2022 is to be one pound less than we are on December 31st 2020 mm -hmm. one pound less in a year and people said that, oh, that's a bunch of crap what do you it's like, trust me. Do that for 20 years. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah 20 years, you'll be 20 pounds lighter. Here's the funny thing. Your hormones will be like, we got this. They, they'll be like, nothing's happened. There's no, there's no famine. There's no apocalypse. We're good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I just had to say that because it's Pat, just. Pat, Pat I'm sorry. Can I, can I uh, just a couple quick diet follow -up. This is what it's all about. Keep going. Yeah. It's a conversation, right? That's mm -hmm. the point. So, you know, I always tell people, um, you know, if, if you, if you ate a lot of blue things and you, you're going to go on the don't eat blue things diet, you'll lose weight. Right. 
<laughs> because you're, you're okay. Right. And so I think any diet that restricts your options, whether it's the options for the, 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 the food types you're eating or the, when you're eating, right. It's going to have this effect that you're going to eat less of something. And if you don't replace it with more of something, you're probably going to come out ahead here. Right. Right. So I think a lot of this stuff is, 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 is overthought. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, to, to that point, Jim, you know, because you sometimes, you, you, yeah, the pendulum swings in the opposite direction. People talk about restriction free dieting. I'm like, what, what the hell are you talking yeah, about? What are you talking about? What, yeah. the, what, what, is, what is that? Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, you're like, yeah. I'm, see, I'm, I'm counting my macros. I don't have restrictions in my diet. I'm like, no, 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 you do have restrictions, right? You, you're just put the restrictions here rather than there. So we have to be adults and, and realize, no, if, if you want to, you know, you know, it's all about managing compromises. Dan. Yeah. If you want to reach so, a goal, and, it's not so that you're going to not. Yeah. I yeah. need a more or less ketogenic diet. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I fast. So that gives me some really easy rules. Like I don't eat starches. Okay. Uh, I don't eat before noon. And if, and if, if it's just using the starch, if a starch comes up and it's not, or if something comes up before noon, I got a rule. I just don't do that. Right. So I'm passing up feeding opportunities, right? So I'm eating less probably than I would have otherwise. Do you see that? And so in diets, I like, I don't, I don't want to go to war over, cause I'm not, I'm not a scientist, right? Over the, the, the chemicals of it. Right. But I, I like anything that gives me an easily enforceable rule in myself. Right. Uh, I think is, is a good way to like, just to, to, to jig it, right. To, to gain it. Okay. Another thing I find, and Dan, you kind of alluded to this is when people first start out, they change five variables. They add exercise, they, they do a certain diet, they change their sleep, they take a supplement, and then maybe they lose 10 pounds. And we have no idea which of those things worked. Okay. Right. And uh, I have, I have in, in, in my, my wife's a social scientist, so she's always reminding me of multivariable problems. Right. Okay. And, and whenever I talk to people about fitness now, I, I really want them to get clear that if you, you, if you make this wholesale cross the board change in your life, right. One, it's not probably sustainable. Right. Two, you don't know what actually worked because there's a lot of variables you're monkeying with, okay? And so on the diet thing, what I usually tell people to do, and there's a, there's a good friend of mine now who really needs to lose some weight and I'm, I'm working with right now, is I say, start out with a food journal and just honestly write down what you eat for two weeks and look at that thing and which things are in there that make me look like I'm eating like I have a death wish, okay? And cut one of those out, all right? Just cut it out. And see if, if, and if the scale moves, just stay there until the scale stops moving and the scale scale stops moving go back and journal again what things in there are obviously bad ideas right cut another one out and keep doing that to the scale moves and keep going that way but then we're only working though with one variable at a time i like that right uh and i have found for me when i need to lose weight that's that works pretty well and for other people i found that works very well right. yeah so the, the the only thing i i would add for people who are um what are the principles here? Well, one of the principles is you can't get away with not having any restrictions. The only question is where are you going to put the restrictions? Yeah. Right. That's, that's, and uh, you know, different strokes for different folks there. I mean, we see that people fasting is a restriction on sort of food timing boundaries, but it's still a restriction, you know, macros are, well, they're restrictions on, on specific macro counts. That is a restriction, right? Um, calorie counts. That's a restriction. You start lopping off certain uh, particular food items or macros. All that's that's a restriction, right? Um, and it's funny because sometimes you'll you'll see people kind of hop from one set of restrictions that doesn't work well for them to another set of restrictions that does work well, and they say, "Well, now I'm free of restrictions." No, you just found a better set of restrictions, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still there's still restrictions in in place. So th I guess that's the general point I'm I'm trying to emphasize is you're you're going to need like restrictions are a good thing, right? Like we need restrictions in life to help us focus, to help us to be productive. So there's this kind of weird mentality, I think, out there of, uh, of like a sort of negative association with like being restrictive. And I guess I'm pushing against that a little bit. Like, no, if you want to achieve something, you're going to have to restrict things in your life. But if we can do the counter, Patrick, uh, you know, uh, Art Devaney's famous line, don't get fat in the first place. If, if we can show up into our, into our teen years eating, eating intelligently, yeah. teenage years, uh, when you go off to college, you don't eat the pizza and beer diet that all my female classmates did at Utah State. And then they wondered how they gained weight. Well, it's like, holy cow, <laughs> I was no uh, nutritionist, but I, I could see why. But if you can, so I'm just, I guess I want the, the listeners to understand that there's proactive and reactive restrictions. 
And probably the best thing you can do for Rowan and the gang, uh, Patrick, is to 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 show them a, an intelligent way of eating, uh, an active life. Yep. Uh, do your best to. Uh, it's studying now, and I, Jim. I've mentioned this in podcasts before. Like when I go to a high school, and I see discus throwers who weigh 230 pounds in high school, who throw a discus 140, and then I weigh 162 and threw 170. It's not that I'm the most wonderful person on earth. I wasn't trying to turn with 80 pounds of yeah, yeah. of adipose tissue. Yeah. Yep. You know. Yep. Um, That's a great point. And so I think we need. So that, what I what I want the, the, the listener and, and, and myself to remind myself is there are proactive things you can do early, like flossing your teeth. At, once you get the, your adult teeth, that's it. You're done. You floss those teeth. You take care of your dental hygiene. When you're 63, like I am, you're fine. You know, if, however, you choose not to take, then you have to react and have dental work and, and all this other stuff. It's true in every aspect of life. Agreed. The little, and here, but here's what I think is funny. The little edges you make, the earlier you make those little edges, like flossing daily, flossing twice a day, eating vegetables at every meal. If you do that at 18, it's much easier to fix than waking up obese at 63. Yeah. I think yeah. Aristotle would agree with that. He would yeah. indeed. Agree. In fact, he called me. He told me that. Exactly. Yeah, he would agree with that. Yeah, he, could, he has a rotary phone, though. That's the whole thing. Your, yeah. He, he butt dialed me with a rotary phone. He's, he's little... <laughs> I so, get... you know, to your point about the kids, you know, it's, it's pretty simple for me because it's like whatever I grew up with, what's not that? Okay, there's a good solution for the kids. I grew up with endless amounts of soda in my house. Okay, yeah, no soda in our house, right? I grew up with just free reign over what we called the the my friends all called it the cabinet of diabetes, right? Because it was just like all the sugary breakfast cereals, the pop tarts. This this, like there's a reason that everybody in the neighborhood wanted to come to my house, right? So okay, not that we don't have the cabinet of diabetes in the house, right? for, yeah, yeah. So I just kind of just negate everything that I grew up with. It caused me to to grow up overweight and unhealthy and have have all these bad habits. So I kind of have like a good counter example, like yeah. learn from hard experience. Um, and then you know we do try to to educate our kids too as best as we can. I mean, because some of these things, you know, it's it's tough. You know, you you both of you have children older than I am. Um, but it's hard. It's hard to get lessons into people's heads that haven't been learned through experience. Sometimes, especially kids' heads. You know what I'm talking about. Yep. Like you do the best you can to try and get them to understand and appreciate it. But it's like, no, no like, no, this is, this is right. <laughs> trust me. Trust me. <laughs> this goes back, Pat, to something we were talking about off the air uh, just before is, you know, we have this, one of the things we make all of our kids do is they have to join the YMC swim team. Oh. Uh, yeah. And they have to, they have to, I mean, we're not cruel, right? If they just hate swimming, they're not, we're not going to like wreck their childhood with it, but uh, the thing with swimming is it's when you first start competitive swimming, it's hell. It's really hard, right? I mean, if you've never swam against a clock before and like everything in your monkey brain is saying, get the hell out of the water, there's not enough air here and you have to, okay, so there's this huge discipline thing to it. And we we make all of our kids swim till they become competent enough that they can do a meet. And if after they do a swim meet, they don't want to do it, that's fine. We've got what we wanted out of this, right? But But, but the idea is to put them in a situation where they have to resolve stress only by winning. Like the only way out of this is to get good. And two, it builds a habit. They're in the pool four days a week, right? And it builds a habit. It builds a habit, a habit, a habit, a habit of exercise and things come with that. And I think that kind of building things into your kids' lives that you want as habits for them when they're your age is really important, whether it's diet or exercise or, or just, just being an athletic, active person, right? And that little thing of just making them all join the swim team, we see these great consequences down the road for them now and what they do and, and stuff. And, and also swimming, I think it's, it's a great athletic base for just about everything too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So my wife, I, I was never a competitive swimmer. My wife was. And so yeah. she, she harps the benefits from that. Uh, martial arts for me, that's why our, we, we have our kids do like you, we have piano, Taekwondo. Now I'm so hesitant to give uh, any parenting advice because mine are still a work in process. So we'll see. Check back with me in 20 years, right? I always say if they, if they go to prison next week, then I'm sorry. Right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Can, I, I would love to talk about the challenge thing a little bit. Yeah. So, so my yeah, the point I want to talk about was um, 
I don't know about YouTube. I would take a guess that most that both of you are probably always challenging yourselves at some point in your life in some area throughout the year, right? Yeah. Um, I probably really challenge myself in my fitness maybe about twice a year, right? But there's always something else that I'm some type of challenge or project, whether it's a book or a business endeavor or even, you know, even just with a, with a family or something like that. So I just wanted to get uh, get your guys thoughts on that. Um, one, whether there's ever a time where you just kind of ease off the gas pedal in all directions. Um, I, I think, yes, Patrick, but. Let me let me put the, the asterisk on that. So in the last couple of weeks, I had a weightlifting meet, what, a month ago now, ish, something like that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, three weeks ago. Yeah. So since then, I've been going to the gym five days a week and doing uh, basically a uh, gym, a, a version of uh, easy strength for fat loss. It's a little bit more hypertrophy. The reps are a little bit higher because, yeah. you know, I'm 63 and I need, uh, you know, I'm strong. I need, I need a little bit of lean body mass. Yeah. I'm with and, you on that. And I'm taking it real easy uh, academically because school's over. But having said that, Patrick, I've set myself up. I hope you, I'm training five days a week and I'm writing a book. I got up this morning at 5 a.m. and wrote, uh, put a program together for these firefighters. It took me two hours. And so I, what I guess what I'm trying to say is once you get yourself in a certain groove, training five days a week, is not a challenge it's called monday tuesday wednesday thursday yes. friday yes. and when you uh you get up in the morning you answer emails and you write things it's those aren't challenges anymore that's that's kind of who i am and the routine i'm using and i thought i would call that a virtue uh, exactly well let's see it's it all ties it all ties back into the exactly uh the, it, it, it's yeah. here are the extremes this is uh fasting 24 hours a day going to seven crossfit classes yeah. and the other one is what you, <laughs> i'm never going to ex exercise or eat a the vegetable i don't Look, make a conscious choice whether i'm going to work out every day i don't make a conscious choice it's just it, anymore i make a conscious choice when i brush my teeth i don't make a conscious choice about my diet anymore i mean it's all just what you do yeah it's dispositional acquired it's acquired disposition now yeah yeah it's habits uh you know we you know, when you when you study any great religious tradition, or you, where or you just go back to Socrates, Plato, or Aristotle, you always find yourself that you, you know uh, you are what you think about. Uh, you are the sum of your habits. That's a phrase I use a lot with people. And boy, does it piss them off. Mm -hmm. You are the sum of your habits. Yep. So if you're 200 pounds, you have carrying out 200 pounds of adipose tissue. Okay you've got to understand that you were part of this and I get, there's also diseases and there's issues and I yeah, get yeah, all yeah, 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 yeah. And then God bless you if they do, but you know, you are the sum of your habits. Exactly. You know, if you're exactly. 30 years old and you, you have one, you, you have a 0, 0.0 in the one semester you wanted to go to college, you keep wondering why, because you chose at 18 not to, Yeah. you know, well, if, 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 if that upsets people, Dan, then they definitely shouldn't read Aristotle because he's a bit of a pessimist on this note. Yes, 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 he is. Yeah. He thinks you're essentially screwed if you don't got the right things at any end of a certain point, right? Well, you know, what is the point of no return? That's what vice is for Aristotle, is you've reached the point of no return with your habits. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What did Coach Mon say? Tells every year, every fall, make yourself a slave to good habits. And yeah. that was his sum of. And it's, and it's weird because any success I have in my life is not because of this overwhelming willpower that I have, this can of whoop ass I open up every morning and drink. It's just because this is what I, this is the chair I get into. There's the gym I work out in. Yep. And folks, I'm not trying to make myself as a hero. Yep. Like someone got on me at a party for being full of myself. A few weeks ago and i thought well and it hurt my feeling because you know i have a nice little resume yeah 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 and it was hard it was hard to get that and maybe i'm full of myself but for god's sakes you know i also gave up a bunch of stuff that i don't even know i gave up yep you know well well i mean like you know if we're talking about um 
Jen, this would be a good question for you. Like, like humility, like there's a difference between humility and self depreciation, right? Like the latter would seem itself a vice, yep. right? Where humility is just having a proper recognition of sort of your place, right? right. Yeah. And, you know, and if you're, if you're falsely self deprecating, that can be a, uh, a dodge of responsibility. <laughs> Agree, and I find it. So a- if I admit, if I admit, there's some shit I'm good at, and I and I should be teaching people how to do right. Uh, and I think there is, there has to be a kind of like, no, I'm I'm good at this. That's why I'm teaching you. That's why I'm leading you. Right. You have to have that gear if you're going to teach or lead. Okay. And if you if you always fall back on this sort of, oh, I'm not that great. I'm not that great. I have no right to speak. Well, then you're dodging the responsibility that you bear to other people you could drag along with you. Right. So. Um, uh, and, and so I think, I think in a lot of ways, false humility is a dodge, right? It's a dodge of what I owe to other people in virtue of what I've done and what I have achieved and what I should be able to share with them now about it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's great. All right, let's, oh. Dan, did you have something you wanted to say about that? Real quick? I don't know. Uh, Jim, everyone knows my Gary player story. I got a chance, this great golfer named Gary. I got a chance to meet him one time. Famous story about him. One day he's having a terrible day on the golf course and he walks off. And a fan says to him, well, I would do anything, Gary, to have one of your bad days. And I guess that just lit him up. And he yeah. turned and he said, no, you wouldn't. You would not get up at 5 a.m. and hit 200 balls. And then yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. your yeah. hand was bled. Yep. And I've always used that. It's a tiny little story. And I'm sure when Horseheiser, 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 something like that, the great uh, Dodger pitcher, Oral Hershiser. And uh, some fan yelled to him, I can hit your stuff. And he looked up in the stands and he goes, not today. Because <laughs> he, he had just won the World Series. And, yeah. uh, sometimes, you know, it comes off as you're arrogant and full of yourself. But the truth is, man, you weren't there at the 5 a.m.s. You weren't there when you were bleeding. You yeah. weren't there when the doctor said, you'll never do this or that again. And you overcame yeah. it. Uh, you know, Jim, it looks like your face has been occasionally uh, yeah, yeah. touched uh, by an opponent. Uh, Ungently touched. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and it's like, wait a second. While you were smoking dope, I was, you know, I was in the library trying to get ahead so I could leave, for, you know, go represent the university that on the weekend. And uh, while, you know, while you were, you know, you know, listening to your, your rock and roll music on your stereo, you know, I was yeah. out training and uh, yeah, I agree with you. It's, it's a tough one. So something about, about the, uh, the challenge bit issue and in the, and competition, right. Um, because I, th- I think this ties into some things that we've been up to here is so um, that's all changed big time for me in the last year or so. And maybe, and maybe it's permanent. Maybe it's not, I don't know. Right. You know, you know, so there, hopefully there's decades left. Right. Um, I love that you did that competition last month, Dan, but I found now, um, especially since my, since I'm seeing my kids surpass me now, uh, I, I have less of a tendency to want to compete. And I don't think it's this like over the hill thing. I think it's that now that I see the kids surpassing me, I don't feel like I need to be the point of the spear. And, and I think, I think it's revealed to me a lot of what I've done and, and how hard I've pushed myself, both you know, athletically, academically, all these ways, was really about subconsciously just setting an example of a way of life to those kids. And now that I see them taking it up and being better at it than I am and stuff like that. So it's funny, I, I had this really big tournament win last December. And then my boys went to state for wrestling in February. And it was funny. It was like those two events kind of got me like, I don't know. This is, I just kind of want to sit back and watch these young guys do the thing now. And, but that doesn't mean um, I'm not challenging myself. Like now, like just using jujitsu as an example, I'm less worried about winning tournaments and more worried about just getting damn good at jujitsu. And those can be different things, right? Oh, yeah. And, and in my academic work, I find myself less worried about like getting the big, you know, publishing resume line and more just getting really damn good at reading Heidegger. Right. You know, uh, and I find that the older I get, the more it's about this kind of quiet mastery than it is about uh, competition. And it's just as just as challenging. Right. But it's a different kind of thing. I think for me, what flipped that was seeing the kids 
surpass me, which is what I think now I've discovered was the point of the program all along. Wow. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a chance to read George Leonard's Mastery? Before? No, I haven't. It's worth it. Actually, the Esquire article, which was the most reprinted article in our history, is better than the book. Yeah. But he's the guy who gets into Akita. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's the one that I, I quote all, but I'm just, I'm riffing off what you just said. By the way, I agree with you. But I love what he said most in the book is true mastery is when you fall in love with the plateau. Yeah. Yeah. And the plateau might last in like as a thrower could last two decades. Yeah. Before yeah. you curve back up uh, in relationships, you know, there's the plateau, you know, where all the, you know, you know, where the, the, the dew is off the glow or whatever the phrase is. Yeah. And that's, and that's when a lot of guys say, bye-bye, moving on. Yeah. But in life, you fall in love with the plateau is the road to mastery. Yeah. And, that's a, and it's interesting. I think it ties back. I, it, in my head, it ties back to the easy strength for fat loss thing. Because easy strength for fat loss is a plateau. Yes. Gonna, I'm going to ask you to lift weights five days a week and go for a walk. Well, what the hell is sexy about that? Yeah. And those, and those weights are going to stay about the same for a long time. Yeah. And yeah. it looks, and, and, you know, like you with Heidegger, with, with, with the other stuff we do academically, there are times where it's just, and then all of a sudden there's that break. Yep. And then you wonder why, and you want to turn to somebody and go, Oh God, it's so simple. Yeah. 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 So because yeah. your brain for a moment is so, I love that brilliant moment of clarity. Yeah. And you're like, Oh yeah, that's so easy. Yeah, you get the, the miles, you know. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I found, you know, and just in the last you know couple of years here, my academic work, I've decided just to kind of retool myself in an entirely different area of philosophy. And I think it's because I'm less worried about how I measure up and just what do I want to be good at and what I do I think is most worth, worthwhile being good at. Or uh, you know, I talked to my, my jujitsu coach recently and and you know, I told him that what I want to do this year is spend it doing stuff I know I'm bad at. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna play a jujitsu game at least in practice that I know is my weak point that I'm really bad at, um, and doesn't even necessarily fit me very well body type wise. But I I want the challenge of just getting good at something, right? And kind of it's a way of starting over, right? Well, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. That, that is a brilliant. It's funny. I, I got to a place in my um, consulting career, uh, Jim, that basically mm -hmm. I learned. I think the job of a consultant is to point out here's your gap. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's, I can, I can go and say, okay, like I read in your book, you're, you're almost universally the strongest guy you fight. Yeah. Right. You, you win yeah. the, you win the weight room. Right. right. And right. so my job is to sit down with you and say, okay, here's what you're not doing. When I work with strength coaches, it's, you don't have loaded carries and you don't have authentic squatting, but yeah. by God, you guys can, I've never seen people bench more than you guys. But yeah, yeah. If you do with those gaps, you're not going to get better. Yeah, and I think that's it's weird because I just gave away my whole model of consulting, but it's absolutely true. Yeah. Just yeah. You look for the things you're not doing, or the things that you've that are, uh, the one program I'm working with. The, the the head coach they went back and counted. I told you this before about the number missed tackles. Yeah, when they have five or less missed tackles they win six or more they lose how simple yes yeah I mean, but so, this, I is mean, why, this is why you need uh consultants is because they're going to spot your confirmation biases right ah. so, so you have this coach who's probably a great bench presser but you that coach is just an awesome bench presser right you know yeah. and he had success teaching people to bench press and so there's going to be this confirmation bias well, they're going to probably draw, I mean, I don't want to overflow it, but the, all these false lines of causality between the bench press and what's going on in the football field, all this yeah. stuff. You, you need someone to come in here who doesn't like the bench press very much and yeah. say, why aren't you carrying shit? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Hey, uh, I, I hate to put a pause on this, but uh, yeah. I know we got, yeah. we got, we got schedules here to keep. Um, so let's, let's finish with this. This has been an absolutely brilliant conversation, by the way. I just I could sit here and listen just to you two talk all day about this stuff. Um, I'd love to hear what you guys are working on now. Um, what projects you have coming up, I don't know, next week, next year. I don't care, whatever you want to share. So why don't we start with uh, you, Jim? Just you know, let us know. Uh, give us a hint with Heidegger and stuff like that. But you can 
give more specifics and then and dan will turn it to you and you can let us know also what's up at, at uh, the old university well uh, first i want to learn how to play daily heave guard okay so that's <laughs> that's coming right. uh um but yeah more seriously uh i'm finishing up uh, a philosophy of mind book right now um and that should begin review process fairly soon awesome uh, yeah working title is thinking about thinking a philosophy of mind for a meaningful life. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping at some point here in 2020 to take a lot of these ideas that have, that have been bouncing around in training around jujitsu since I wrote ages athlete and put them into some kind of book format. Uh, so those, those are my two immediate projects I have going right now. Um, and then, you know, the semester is starting soon. So I have to think about teaching. So you have to, yeah, get back to that at some yeah, point. Very yeah. cool. Awesome. Jim, yeah. we'll be, we'll be chat with you again later today. So that we'll get to uh, dive more into, into, yeah. into some of that, but Dan, good, sir. What, what's, uh, what's new with you and what's coming down the pipeline at Dan John university? Well, first off, I begin my challenge this week of the 10,000 swings, 500 a day. Uh, I'm not looking forward to it. I, uh, I've been there, done that, but I'm here to support others. Uh, in fact, on the screen right here underneath uh, you lovely people is uh, a chapter from Easy Strength that I'm uh, going, uh, Pavel sent back. So I'm, I'm adding a few things here and there. and uh, So I'm working on that. Um, over at the university, uh, Brian keeps making up great, uh, updates. One thing I am doing is I am posting a few of my uh, essays or as I'm writing stuff, as I'm trying to correct things, um, I am actually sending it to the forum, uh, you know, maybe what would be six, seven pages of, of paper. I just cut and paste it and ask for feedback because one of the things I, I find myself doing, um, and it's something we, you know, you go to a workshop and you come back and, uh, oh, the ASLR is a seven, but you need a PRQ on the MRG, uh, is you use the code yeah. and the problem with, when you when you when you write a book as broad as easy strength can be, I, I worry about the gaps. <laughs> gaps. I worry about what I'm saying versus what the the reader is hearing. Yeah. yeah. And so by by sending it out, I get sometimes I get pretty good feedback. Like you lost me here. Oh, yeah. and then I look at it. It's like yeah, well, no shit. It's, yeah. I lost, it make, I lost myself. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I have that. Uh, but, but you just, you know, uh, uh, and then uh, personally, um, things are things are strange, you know. But with with some of the stuff from the world, but I, I, I always think of the last three words of uh, the Count of Monte Cristo: wait and hope. So beautiful. My, uh, my vision of my vision is back. In fact, I have a document on my. It's a protected document. Uh, in case I die, you won't be able to get open it, but it's called hope. And I write it every day because I'm trying to rebuild my hope. I, I, I feel like I've, this going to, please don't take this like I'm, 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 but I've been, I just feel like we've been as a group punched down a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, and I let myself drift a little bit down. Uh, it's not like it used to be, but I, I want to make sure that I, I keep that bright spark that I've always been. Uh, so I'm, I want to be a, much more hopeful. So That's I don't cool. believe in resolutions, but I do. My goal for 2021 is to reignite my hope. Awesome. Oh, Love nice. it. Very good. Um, all right. So I will link Dan John University in the show notes. You know what? We'll link to some of Jim's work as well. So yeah. people can check that out. Uh, Ageless Athlete. And uh, maybe I'll link a few of your philosophy papers in there for fun as well, sure. Jim. But, uh, gentlemen, an absolute blast. Really appreciate you taking the time to be here. You bet. Thank you. Talk soon, kids. You bet.